Well, Sandy McLaughlin was a very uh, energetic, dynamic fellow who had done a tremendous amount of things, not just for, for himself and for his woodworking uh, business and for his lumber yard, but also for the community. Back in the mid to late 70s, when I first came to Kingston, um, McLaughlin Lumber was the place to go for lumber and tools. So I spent a lot of time there. So when the time came and he was working in the family business, he saw an opportunity to tell the story. Wood in the service of mankind, he called it. I remember a museum that was somewhat tucked away behind uh, Sandy McLaughlin's store, his lumber store. Most Saturdays, Dad would disappear to go off to auctions. He amassed a very, very interesting collection of, uh, of antique tools and also of uh, you could call it, you know, uh, traditional crafts, you know, like uh, he had a bark canoe, a dug up canoe, some whirly gigs, uh, you know, folk art or that sort of thing. So he would go off and get, uh, I guess, tools amongst uh, also furniture as well, because he was interested in antique furniture. Uh, but the tools I wouldn't see, they would all go, go to wherever he was storing them uh, for this ultimate intention of uh, displaying them in a museum. He would talk to friends, he'd put the word out. And before I knew it, um, some things were purchased, some things were given. The museum was originally conceived by him in 1967 as a centennial project. The building was constructed by Mr. White in Lanark County in the early 1840s. Um, and that it had been bought and dismantled by Sandy McLaughlin and brought down and reassembled in Kingston. Set about numbering all of the logs so that he could take it apart one by one. And then they put all the logs back together, putting them one by one. And the thing that really fascinated me was the fact that when they turned the lights on, when they had actually wired it up and so on, they were able to see that there was already a set of marks on all of the logs. The house had been moved once before, and I loved that idea. I always showed those marks to any visitors who came. Being uh, just the, the log building itself, we had a lot of stuff crammed into it, and, and the, the displays were very tight. It was a very dense thing, and unlike probably most museums. Uh, you go into it, I've seen all the photos where there'd just be a rows and rows and shelves and shelves of just woodwork and tools, all sorts of stuff. And he kept collecting. So people uh, who I talked to, who visited the, the museum and its old location, would come in and said, you'd be walking kind of like this too. He then saw the educational opportunity and worked with various educators, uh, some in particular, who then created exhibits. Dad had employed uh, a curator to uh, build a display. His name was Dave Henshaw and some other uh, student helpers and, and I was a helper and I, I, I enjoy I remember enjoying the the creative aspect of preparing the displays um, we'd have an idea of how we wanted to exhibit a particular uh, item and we'd have to go into the wood working shop and build shelves and cut old wood and then paint it to make it look like old wood and and all that kind of stuff it was very very enjoyable perhaps the the most fun job I ever had in my whole life. <laughs> I heard about the fact that it would go up for auction and that would mean uh, that it would be likely leaving Kingston. I didn't feel that that was appropriate and I talked to my council about it and council didn't feel it was appropriate either. Everybody wanted to save it for Kingston but nobody knew exactly at that point how to do it and it had to be done quickly. At that time there were all sorts of possibilities. They were talking maybe of selling it to the private and so on. So uh, my father, who, is, uh, who was at that time the biggest antique tool collector in Quebec, and a few of his friends, because it was big, uh, asked me to go and visit and make a list of what was in there because they were interested in buying it you know, and putting a bid in anyway, when it was put for sale. And I didn't feel the, that we had the luxury of time to uh, do something else, but to just put the money on the table. 
So I talked to my council and my council was in agreement and we put money on the table for the auction which took place I think on the 13th of June 1982. And I remember it because that figure had to be kept secret because if it was known then other people who might be bidding on that museum would have a go at it. I had heard to the branches before that it was uh, too high for what the, the, the Quebec connection could, uh, could do for it. So it, it had been abandoned at that time. So uh, Pittsburgh Township bought the museum. And we had a considerable discussion, uh, argument, or whatever you want to call it, about where the museum had to be placed. Subsequently, council came back and a motion was made that it be put at Grass Creek Park. Grass Creek Park is a wonderful location, was a wonderful location. The museum's purpose has been, since 83, taking advantage of this park location and focusing a lot on the pioneer aspects of woodworking. When Pittsburgh bought the museum, I went and visited Hans and say, look, you know, I have some experience with antique tool. If I can be of help to you for the museum, I'd gladly do so. Six months later, it's about 5.30 in the morning. My wife and I are sleeping. Phone rings. Hans says, you know, uh, Hans Westenberg here, blah, blah, blah. And of course, I have no, I don't remember what it is, you know, we're half uh, sleeping. So he says to me, uh, would you like to be on the uh, board of the new museum that we have opened? I said, sure, you know, I'm happy to do that. And uh, then I, got, I get to the college and people are congratulating me for being on the board. And I say, what the hell is that? And, and they tell me, oh, it's in the newspaper today that you've been appointed as a board member. Okay, that's great, <laughs> you know, and that's how I got involved. Each person that's come in here has had a different vision of what the museum represents, still staying true to the original collection. The museum's evolved in the time it's been here. It came here and we're now celebrating its 30th anniversary. But in 83, uh, there were such dedicated volunteers. We built the collection and added several thousand tools and of course, we had people starting to call us to uh, that out of the blue, you know, like my grandfather died and there's a, a few uh, pieces in the, in the basement. Uh, would you be interested in them and that sort of thing? One of the big projects that, uh, that started up uh, towards the end of my tenure was uh, were, were plans for the for the addition for the new uh, complex. We realized that the the building that we were in was not adequate to store or to uh, to do anything. So uh, the idea was planted for the addition to the building. And uh, on that one, Gordon, Mr. McGibbon was the pushing force, pulling force. Uh, we got grants, we got help, we participated in the building. Money was not available for a new building. However, there was money for additions. So this giant exhibit hall is actually available for access, access through a tunnel, which connects it, which therefore makes it an addition to the log house. What one board member um, uh, uh, fancied himself a uh, um, a good woodsman. He probably was, but uh, uh, it was decided that the museum needed a, a flagpole and uh, it had to be a, a tree rather than a, something fabricated. The tree was identified and um, uh, one of the docents and I went down to uh, assist in the, in the cutting process. Well, we got a long lecture about how to cut a tree, how to notch, where to, where to you know where to where to notch, how to notch, da 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 da. And this went on for some time, and uh, we were told that the tree was going to be cut in such a way that it would fall precisely in this direction. Well, of course, it went 180 degrees <laughs> the other way. One unique element the museum has is the floor uh, leading to the uh, exhibit hall. It's comprised of wafers, thinly sliced uh, 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 pieces of logs, and they are embedded in the floor with a uh, certain type of uh, glue, especially developed for that purpose, and it's 
unique, as I indicated, uh, in any type of facility. The old one that was there that was put in by Gordon McGibbon and Co. Um, was a great idea, but uh, it was lifting up in terms of problems. So we set the chance of doing the sa uh, same thing while solving all the problems Gordon wasn't able to solve. So uh, we had to figure that out and did a lot of work. My favourite part of being at the museum is always the shoulder seasons, when things are a bit quieter, and that's when I'm up at the front desk. So anyone that comes at, or came at that time of year, I would often get the chance to take them on a little private tour of behind the scenes. Um, that would be taking them down into the storage area and showing a couple of really adamant collectors what we have. It's important that the collection is stored for future generations. Um, it'd be great and Sandy would love it had we always had the collection on display. But that idea of a you know, wedding photo, if you put it on display, it's not going to last very long. But if you keep it in a box, you know, no one ever sees it, but it'll be there for a very long time. So trying to balance those two needs is so hard as a museum curator. Downstairs there are several complete shops and it's really nice to maintain that record. Uh, you can look at a tool and you can figure out how it was used and how much use it got, but it's a whole other league to have the entire shop there and know which parts of the trade used which tools, what was important, and the rest. Looking at the artifacts themselves, that can be really interesting. Hearing about some of the skills, how they were used, that can be interesting, but for me it comes alive when you know about the people who did the stuff. This place gets in your blood. Once you get working here, you get, so you acquire an appetite for things that are made of wood and for the process of woodworking. You get bitten by a bug. You find one thing that you think is just incredibly cool, and after that you've got to get two of them. And as they say, once you get three of them, that's a collection.